to weep or not to weep is the subject of today's message. This may sound like something you've heard before, and in fact, it is a phrase that is loaned in a way from William Shakespeare, but we're not here to look at an English play or to seek to entertain. We're here to seriously ponder the answer to that question, to weep or not to weep. Jesus Christ, our savior, made certain statements at a particular point in his life. It was not a comfortable point. It was not what you might call a happy point. It in fact was during the greatest duress that any of us listening to this almost assuredly have experienced. Our Lord Jesus had been beaten, bloodied, possibly had parts of his spine ripped out, was with a crown of thorn upon his head, full of blood, full of pain, racking throughout his body. And in the midst of carrying a great cross made out of wood upon his back. And as he suffered so, women came along and mourned for him and wept. And our Lord Jesus, in all of his pain, in the midst of all of that, being God, who the Bible says is love, and having come to do something that would show God's love forever before mankind in a way that no one could deny that God had not done all he could for us in expressing his love, our Lord Jesus was on his way to be crucified when he turned and made this statement as it is recorded in Luke 23, 28, where it says, but Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. How our Lord Jesus Christ could have mustered the heart, could have mustered the energy, could have mustered the mind in the midst of such suffering, such personal suffering, to have his focus not upon pity, but upon love and upon conveying a message that was vitally needed to be heard and responded to by those who stood by and heard him and by all of us down through the last two millenniums to have heard and to have responded to the Lord Jesus was certainly the son of man and yet the son of God to take such a moment and make such a statement at such a time in his life. And yet he did. But there is a question we have asked at the outset of this message that comprises this message. To weep or not to weep? Should they have been weeping? Should we weep when we see that story? of Jesus suffering so for us? Should we weep? And when we do weep, are we considering that he suffered so for us? Or are we just considering a man, a mere man who suffered such torments? And oh, what a pity it is to see. And oh, why did they do that to that mere man? Or is there something more, something beyond that? Something that caused God himself who was on his way to give his life for us to stop and pause and make such comments. We look back to the verse before that, which introduces what we just heard, which says this in Luke 23, 27, and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him, lamented him, lament, to lament means to mourn, to mourn from the heart, from the soul. Have you? Consider Jesus in this way in your life? Are you considering Jesus in this way at this part of your life? As things fall apart throughout the world, as COVID-19, as they slapped that name onto that pestilence, which came from they set up back, as all things are being changed here, and as our own government seems to be crumbling further and further until the point where it seems even possible that our very nation would have such a sudden turnaround that perhaps the North Koreans would come up upon the western coast, upon the beaches of Los Angeles, of Southern and Northern California, that possibly the Muslims might actually launch such missiles with nuclear armament into them, into the midst of us here in our nation, 
that perhaps 9-11 was just the prelude of much more such situations to take place here upon our nation, our formerly so secluded continent. And there followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. Should you follow Jesus, lamenting what a horrible thing happened to him? Friends, it is clear that such weeping should take place. And yet how shall we? How shall we? Would the Lord Jesus Christ dare tell you how to weep? Is he gonna tell you how to cry? Is someone gonna actually tell you when you should shed tears and how you should shed tears? Well, if he does, he better be God. And he is. And so, yes, you should weep for your children. The Lord Jesus said, weep for your children. Luke 23, 28, you have been commanded by God in the midst of God's suffering, in the midst of the Son of God, in the midst of the triune God, having had that occurrence in the midst of them, the Holy Spirit of God grieved to see Jesus suffering. God the Father grieved to see his Son suffering. And yet he says to weep for your children while he is suffering. What of your children? What of those who come? What of those who as children to you or those who are of your own flesh and blood? What of their lives? What of their lives in this present state that our country and that our world is in? What of their lives when Jesus is being prophesied to come back and to come back soon by so many? What of their lives when at death's door there is but a step between me and death? As David said, the great psalmist, as God said through him, Weep for your children. Weep for yourselves. The Lord Jesus in his compound statement also said to weep for yourselves. Should you weep for yourselves in considering that Jesus has been crucified and paid for your sins? That Jesus bore your sins upon him? That in the garden of Gethsemane, your sins were placed upon him until great drops of blood proceeded to come through his sweat? through until an angel had to come and keep his human flesh and blood body alive until he took your sins down the Via Della Rosa, down the way of pain, up to the hill of a skull to Golgotha, where he was crucified, where he took your sins and where your sins were paid for if you will but believe in Jesus. Weep for yourselves, he says. In beholding Jesus paying for your sins, in beholding Jesus taking your sorrow upon him, he is telling you to weep for yourself, for your sins, for your situation, for the pain that you have before you. Because I must preach the truth as other preachers may not, makes me no regard. But I must give you what God has given, what Jesus who preached on hell, more than any other preacher preached. You have hell before you, he says. You have worse than hell? What is that? That death and hell would be taken up after you have been judged before Jesus in that great moment when you shall meet him. And death and hell with you in it are cast into the lake of fire, which shall burn with fire and brimstone forever and ever. Oh, Jesus says, weep for yourselves. Jesus goes even further being God and says, weep not for me, unquote. Is he making this statement maliciously? Is he making it in the manner of which his heart is saying, you've done this to me, don't weep for me, I'm going to get you? Impossible, impossible for such sentiment to have existed within the heart, within the soul, within the being, within the spirit of a man of God who is on his way and who was in the midst of paying for your sins. I'm doing this for you. Weep not for me. Weep for your children. Weep for yourselves. Do you not see what is taking place around you? It is as if Jesus is saying, do you not see the Romans standing there in your midst with their swords, their heavy swords? Have you ever put a sword in your hand? I have a gladius Roman sword on my wall. I lift that thing one time and I know I understand how so many were killed. Oh friend, they had the Romans in their midst 
and yet they're weeping for him. Friend, we have in our midst, I only mentioned two possible ends of such destruction, wherein in Jerusalem there was blood in the streets. We had our dear sister read to us from Josephus. We watched a video from YouTube that proclaimed and visualized it. We listened to Matthew Henry's commentaries on Luke 23 in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem, the pinnacle of the nation of Israel. And we sat here in our chairs comfortable, well at ease, not realizing that further such destruction is predicted and proclaimed by historians, by sociologists, by people who have posted it all throughout the internet and written it all throughout books and even proposed and given videos on it. It is taught even in schools how America now finds itself on the verge of such destruction and the world as well with the ecology declining rapidly further daily weep not for me weep not for me as if jesus had said in this moment in this time in history why are you just going about do you not realize that death will come and your chance for salvation for a life of love in jesus of loving your brothers and sisters being filled with the love of jesus so much that it flows out of you and you go out and you share jesus with others and bring them in that the book of acts that we read about in chapter two is here ready to be recreated before your eyes and every century since jesus gave his life for us rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven where he sits now at the right hand of God. We have had such an inheritance given and yet we may weep for him and go back to our sin. And yet Jesus Christ shall come again. What of that friend? What of that? Weep not for me. And yet our Lord Jesus who has said to weep for your children, to weep for yourself, to weep not for me, says something to whom? To whom is Jesus speaking? He names here. Let me read the entire passage for you again. But Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem, are these to be differentiated are we to make a difference between the daughters of jerusalem and the daughters of zion the daughters of the kingdom of god the daughters of the kingdom of heaven are we to make a difference between those had who had proposed themselves to be the bride of of god and those whom god in his mercy has separated and caused to be the bride of christ we have those who call themselves Christians, who would gather together and say, I am with Jesus. And yet, let us rip off the covering, let us pick up the stone, let us behold what is underneath the slime, the dirt and all, to proclaim a reality that the average man on the street who has decided not to go to church will tell you quite quickly that he has seen such vile things come out of the church that he has decided he will never go to a so-called church of christ ever again because such daughters of jerusalem have portrayed something that the world does not want and yet if you are a reader of history you will know you will know or perhaps if you've been to china where revival is flourishing or if perhaps you've been somewhere where you saw this actually taking place amongst congregations of God's people. And yet the Bible says broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. But narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to life and few there be that find it. Wait a minute, the Christian, the church man, the church woman says, are you about to apply that verse, brother, to the church? That verse is for the lost. We're the same. Yes, I shall apply it directly there where I believe the Lord Jesus wants it applied first. Judgment, the Bible says, shall begin at the house of the Lord. And so the world has watched and the world has seen the Broadway, the majority of all churches. They have seen, they have not seen love. Jesus said they 
shall know you by your love for one another. They have not seen this, no phone call, until the youngest among us identified it and realized that that was not real. That was false. That was fake. That was phony. Jesus, Jesus, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, be daughters of Jerusalem no more. He turns to you to wake you up. Weep not for me. Weep for yourselves. Have you ever weeped over your sins? Have you ever looked and realized what Jesus did for you? And instead of weeping for him, wept over your sins? How you have offended this holy God, this holy Savior. Take your eyes and leave them no longer upon the hypocrites. But let your finger that points out, let that one join the other three and have four fingers pointing back to you, the chief hypocrite in your life. Do you look at me this morning and call me a hypocrite? Go ahead. Realize that you have four times that being pointed in your direction. The mirror does not have me in it when you look in there. What of you? What of a soul? Shall I weep for your children? Shall I weep for you? Shall I weep for my children? Shall I weep for myself? Friends, let us not be daughters of Jerusalem, but let us look to Jesus with our souls, with our hearts contrite, a word that means for your heart to be broken over your sin. Jesus, Jesus. We read again, Luke 23, 28. But Jesus turning un to them said comma let us stop at those six words dear friends jesus is turning unto you god has been speaking to you from heaven from the pages of the word of god what we commonly know as the bible every day of your natural life even before you could read and jesus has been turning unto you from this passage, Luke 23, 28, every day of your life. Jesus has been turning unto you every day of your life. The words have been there to record a statement, to record a fact, to record a reality, to record an occurrence, to record an event that takes place in your life every day. People focus on the devil, the great enemy. The Bible says, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Jesus has been turning unto you. I don't know what to do with my life. I just, I just can't, if I can have this, it'll fix it. And you get it and it doesn't fix it. If I can have that, it'll fix it. And you get it and it doesn't fix it. If I can have this, if I can have that, even now you're still focusing on something else. I tell you, Jesus is turning unto you. Will you not turn around and look at him? Will the Savior be putting his hand upon your shoulder? Will you, as the Bible says, be pulling your shoulder from the Savior, as it is written, he that hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy, without remedy. But no need for this. Oh, you preach doom, you preach gloom. I preach reality from the word of God. I preach Jesus. I preach rejoicing. I preach laughter. I preach love. I preach joy. I preach eternal joy. I preach something that you'll have, that you'll sell all that you have to have. And when you have it, no one can take it away from you forever and have a joy with Jesus, the love of God. You will have him. Jesus is turning unto you. Turn around. Turn around and look at Jesus. You think your life is so full. You think you're so smart. You're so proud. You're so full of yourself until no one can pour anything else in. Jesus turns to you. Jesus turns to you. You, friend, to weep and not to weep. 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 The answer to this entire message is summed up in one word. Weep, weep over your sins. Weep, weep over your judgment that comes quickly and then lasts forever. Weep, 
weep and turn to him who is so merciful, who is so loving, who has turned to you and has now has his hand upon your shoulder and says, turn to me now. Look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. 